All right. Welcome, everyone, to Nerd of the Rings. Today, we have the one and only Sir Richard Taylor, the co-founder and creative director of Aweta Workshop. Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Lovely to be here. Thanks, Matt. It's uh, very thrilling to talk to you. I, I've long been uh, uh, a person who appreciates the behind the scenes being uh, a video guy myself. I really, uh, really enjoy the behind the scenes work that interests me just as much as the stuff that goes on in front of the camera. So I'm excited to be talking to you today. Um, my first question for you, we'll dive right in. How are you first introduced to the world of Tolkien? Sorry, Matt, and sorry, everyone. <laughs> That's quite all right. I've been working down in the workshop this morning, <laughs> sanding, and even though I had my mask on, it's now <laughs> just started to tickle my throat. And it's <laughs> my so my apologies for coughing. Oh, that's all right. Um, well, probably like most people, I, I actually was introduced to the world of Tolkien uh, through The Hobbit, not through uh, The Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah. Just simply, I read the book when I was a child. Uh, I think it was about the age of 12. I, as I've explained in the past, my reading age at that young age wasn't good enough to consume Lord of the Rings, even though it's uh, sat on the shelf. Um, and I've been learning to read by reading uh, uh, 2000 AD comic. My mum was a school teacher and she was she was aware enough that if your if your child is struggling with the reading age then get them to read anything at all that might uh, excite their minds into the love of reading and so uh, she kindly promoted the idea of reading comics and my comic um of of choice at the time was 2000 ad with Stronti and dogs and judge dread etc uh but um, but by the time I got to 12 years old, I was advanced enough uh, to be able to read The Hobbit. And that, obviously, like everyone on the call, uh, that moment was transformative. Mm. Um, I, I had the good fortune of purchasing for $2 a, uh, a print, uh, a dog-eared print of the triptych of the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch at the same time. And I hung that above my, my bed, um, which I was able to look at every day. And there's some combination between reading The Hobbit and viewing that picture mm. where it dawned on me that you could conceptualize parallel worlds running in tune with your own, with your own practical, ordinary life. Um, that if you were to go inside your head and dream that little bit more, you could imagine yourself being in these unique and bizarre and wonderful worlds. And that, that really began to catalyze things. As some of the British people listening on the call will, will remember, um, Rupert the Bear uh, was a children's book that I grew up on that my mum used to read me. And that had uh, the the wonderful realities of sort of jumping through time to other worlds. And uh, that had sort of initially sparked the idea, but it wasn't until these two things that I actually, actually stopped for a moment and went, wow, I can actually dream on my own fantastical worlds. And, yeah. and that, that, that really kicked it all off. Wow. So, so from, from that point, so how does, uh, I'm curious, how, how did you get started with, uh, Weta Workshop. Obviously, you know, from a young age, you had kind of your creativity set ablaze. Um, so then, you know, fast forward us a bit. How did you get started with Weta? Well, my wife Tanya and I moved to Wellington when we were 17, and uh, I came down to do three years of visual communication and design at Wellington Polytech, and Tanya came down to do a English degree. Um, Tanya actually packed it in two years in uh, and started working uh, to support us. And I finished my course. But in my final year of 
uh, that graphic design course, we actually were requested uh, to do a television commercial as part of the course. And uh, I had no awareness at all at the time because of where I'd grown up and my upbringing. I didn't really understand what the television industry was. But in that final year, this was this was eye-opening, almost yeah. uh, a revelation to me. And I, where some of my colleagues and friends at, at school weren't necessarily as into it as I was, I sort of really uh, responded to this opportunity. And so that started me thinking about um, the potential of working in the television industry, never imagining that the film industry was out there in New Zealand. And then Tanya and I, when I left uh, Polytech, uh, Tanya and I set up a little workshop in, the, in our flat, actually, um, initially on top of the double bed. We had a sheet of custom board under the bed, and uh, I'd put it on top of the bed each day, and we'd make <laughs> things there, and then we slowly grew the workshop. We were called RT Effects at the time. I had a 10-speed mm. bicycle with a toolbox on the back, and used to go around doing TV commercials and such like. Uh, and then we had the good fortune of meeting Peter Jackson. And I think we it was on Heavenly Creatures, mm -hmm. uh, two or three movies in with Peter, that uh, we decided to form Weta. And uh, with news, Weta is named after an indigenous New Zealand bug, uh, ah. which is a very beautiful insect in our country. Uh, been around for 65 million years, been around since the dinosaurs and so a very, very special icon of our country. So it seemed a, uh, a wonderful name for an effects company that was going to start building little monsters. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so I, I asked uh, some of my followers on Twitter and everything and Instagram um, to submit some questions for you. So I'm going to kind of pull in some of my own and some of theirs. Um, so we got a question here from Eric Bull. He uh, seems to have some inside knowledge here, so you might have to explain this for the rest of us, but how did, quote, number eight wire mentality shape Weta Workshop and create the effects in The Lord of the Rings? So uh, what? Eric, yeah, hi, Eric. <laughs> That's actually a really lovely question, and I appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, it's, it is a bit of a well-worn cliche now, the number eight fence and wire mentality, but it actually is a real thing and an extraordinarily real thing. In fact, the sign outside of our building, less than 15 metres from where I'm sitting, uh, the wetter inside the sign is literally made out of number eight fencing wire mm. uh, to, to add further uh, metaphor to this commentary. Um, I just give some um, sense to what this means, those of that are listening that don't really understand what this mentality is. Mm, um, yeah. Remember that New Zealand is a island nation at the furthest distance from uh, the world as you can almost get, last stop before the South Pole. And when the first uh, settlers moved out here and then the first immigrants and then the, uh, the, the first communities forming, etc. You couldn't just ring home to the UK and ask for a spare tractor part to be sent. Mm. So uh, that that very innovative, um, uh, just give it a go, fix it on the fly mentality started to come to be. And uh, number eight fencing wire is a particular diameter of fencing wire. I, I've used uh, miles of it <laughs> to do the fencing on our on the farm where I grew up. And it's very malleable, and you can fix things with it. You can strap up the uh, muffler on your car. You can make an aerial for your car out of it. You can, you know, you can fix your gum boot with it if you have to. And um, and we literally use number eight fencing wire in the building in that manner still today. Uh, and that's really where the term came from. How did it specifically uh, affect our work on Lord of the Rings? It actually had an extraordinary impact, probably the singularly most uh, critical impact. Please appreciate that when Peter asked us to work on Lord of the Rings, we were still fairly green. We'd done Hercules and Xena for seven years. We'd done three or four feature films. Uh, 
and a number of other things. But suddenly going from uh, The Frighteners, which was a $14 million movie, to A Lord of the Rings, added the $360 right. million dollar movie, was a huge leap, of course. And it required all of our team to have a mentality of just giving it a go. And yeah. uh, with little or no training in some cases, only one eighth of our staff had ever worked on a film or TV show before when we started Lord of the Rings, bringing that sort of can-do attitude, that innovating, yeah. fix-it-on-the-fly mentality was hugely important and uh, really the underpinning of what we ended up doing on the movies. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, so you mentioned, obviously, going from smaller films uh, and then the big behemoth that we all want to talk about, Lord of the Rings, of course. Um, so we had another question uh, from a viewer. Uh, Brighter Moon asked, the Lord of the Rings books are full of fantastical creatures. Which creature was the hardest to translate visually from page to film? Wow, that that I've never been asked that question. That that's a that's a uh, tricky one to answer because mm. I, I'll come at it with a slightly different angle. Yeah, I would like to think, and some of you may uh, beg to differ with me, that the creatures within Lord of the Rings have a plausible reality to them mm -hmm. because of the. The, the physiology, the, the, the physical uh, construction of their anatomy. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Balrog, uh, a totally fantastical creature of, of um, shadow and flame, but a, a creature all the same that we've based around the anatomy of a bull or of a sumo wrestler, as I've mentioned in the past, oh, yeah. obviously entirely inspired by John Howell's amazing design. But he, in turn, draws his characters to have anatomical believability to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Felbies, how often have we seen dragons uh, represented on film where their wingspan would be incapable of holding their body mass? Mm -hmm. So you, you look at uh, creatures that exist in our own ecology of our own world and translate the learnings from those to make the plausibility of the creatures that you're designing for a fantastical world. And if you look at the fell beast, its wingspan is colossal to mm -hmm. hold up the body mass that it is that it is uh, carrying. It's got a huge uh, uh, bird-like uh, uh, chest cavity to carry the muscles necessary. I think um, I, if I was to comment on what would be the hardest. I think the watcher in the water was mm. the ch most challenging. Tolkien always gives you such extraordinary descriptives um, to help uh, conceptualize and then build something. But the watcher in the water was was open to interpretation somewhat. And uh, mm. I think it's Daniel Falconer's design that we ultimately sculpted. Uh, but even in the sculpting of it, we were still trying to conceptualize this very large creature that lives in a relatively small lake that's mm -hmm. tentacled, that has the ability to pick up uh, hobbits in its, uh, in its tentacles, while still having a ferocity to it, while still mm -hmm. being a huge surprise, because it has to be, at that moment, Peter wanted sort of a, a jump scare-like moment where this thing bursts forth out of the water, its mouth had to be uh, representative of a creature that we may know, such as an octopus, but uh, uh, look ferocious and scary and so on. So if I was to pick one uh, amongst a huge menagerie of creatures, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the watcher in the water would be the one that caused us to scratch our heads the most. Yeah, that's a great answer. And... And it's one of those that, as far as runtime, you know, you mentioned obviously Smaug in there. Um, you know, runtime wise, Watcher in the Water doesn't have a whole lot of screen time, but uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I always uh, wanted to have an opportunity for us to explore that further. Something I always wanted the opportunity to do. It was an impossibility, but uh, 
was to do a sort of the fauna and flora uh, uh, book or documentary uh-huh. on the world of Middle Earth and actually study each of these creatures and their their unique habitats and, and oh, wow. explore them further. It, it's, it sadly wouldn't happen, but <laughs> wouldn't that be lovely? Because uh, I, I truly believe that Tolkien, at, when he was writing, was he wasn't just plucking these ideas out of his mm-hmm. mind. I've got to believe that he was actually building these constructs of of these fantastical creatures in his mind as if he was literally seeing them in in a uh, a, a written document or documentary so mm-hmm. it'd be so lovely one day to uh, but anyway we'll get we'll move on that, I, that's a great dream for uh, me to have in my uh, in in my uh, you know quiet times so. yeah i i would watch that in a heartbeat it's it, it kind of reminds me of you know after james cameron did the huge uh titanic blockbuster and then he went and made documentaries um down in the ocean so we just need you to go you know exploring with the watcher in the water yeah exactly um so i like asking this question um i think i'm getting a little feedback there from your speaker um i like asking this question from people involved in uh the lord of the rings um because it was kind of a, uh, you know, I it's somewhat of an unexpected hit. Um, you know, uh, it it certainly caught fire. You know, it's it was a little different media coverage back then than it was today. You know, you can never create something on that scale today in relative secrecy. Um, at what point in the process did you realize, oh my gosh, we've got something huge on our hands here? Yeah, that. That's an interesting question too, because uh, it's hard to explain uh, when you're working on a project, or certainly when I am, and I'd like to think that most of my colleagues feel similarly, you actually don't stop to go, oh gosh, this is going to be a blockbuster, or I'm hoping I'm working on a big hit, or gee, I'd love to win an award for this this work. You, you just simply don't think like that, or, or I certainly don't. I, I feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to do this level of creative work for a living, and then to do it on something like The Lord of the Rings, or an Avatar, or a King Kong, or a yeah. Narnia, you can imagine. Um, so you're caught up in all of that, and you aren't really, I, I didn't stop to ever go, gosh, I wonder if this is going to be a huge hit. You more are concerned about, um, gosh, I wonder whether I can do uh, tribute to the written word and to justice to the fan base around the world that needs and wants this to be special. And that's, that's what's clogging up your brain. But in answer to the question, uh, Tanya and I were incredibly fortunate to uh, be invited to uh, go on the junket to Cannes, the, mm. the now famous, or Cannes, the, the famous film festival, yeah. uh, 20 minute screening of Lord of the Rings. And anyone listening knows all about it, probably knows more than I know about it. But, uh, <laughs> but that was one of the most extraordinary moments of my life. Uh, we had been to Cannes, uh, I don't know, 15 years, 10 or 15 years earlier, no, 10 years earlier, uh, to help promote brain dead. And we stayed mm. in our combi camper van an hour and a half out of town, and we walked in each day uh, into town and caught up with Peter uh, and and the Windup team and helped them promote the movie. And that was incredible, and that was mm. you know, really awesome. But to be there with Lord of the Rings, and uh, they put us up in the Carlton. Um, I might have mentioned this before, but interestingly, there when we were checking out, the lady behind the counter said to Tanya, "Oh, we oui, Monsieur Madame, you have not spent any of your uh, of your room allowance." And we're like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> We had cautiously sat in the middle of the bed, not touching anything, not <laughs> eating anything, going out to eat every morning and every night because the cost of a cup of coffee at the time was <laughs> eye-watering. 
and then only to discover that we had had uh, this sum of money on our room every day. Oh, just so, <laughs> so pitiful. But um, sitting in the cinema with this group of uh, cautious uh, journalists who mm. were, you know, what's going to come from a director that made a splatter movie and a puppet movie and a small budget horror movie and uh, and how could this have been made in New Zealand and and everyone was very uh, pleasant but you could certainly sense an undercurrent of uncertainty and as that 20 minutes unfolded and uh, thankfully for us, uh, it was it had a lot of our work in it, specifically the miniatures that we built for the Marsville Hall and the and the stairs of Casadon and uh, at the bridge, etc. And to sense the emotions in the room. And when it finished, people were people had had wept. People were overwhelmed. People were overjoyed. And then for the next three or four days of uh, of the junket and doing press and uh, and getting to chat with the journalists from all over the world uh, and then the party in the big castle and being there with Christopher Lee and, and all of the cast uh, uh, was just overwhelming and, mm. and so, so brilliant at a marketing level to have shifted the mindset of the world's press and from that moment, we knew that if they supported the film, then we felt confident that mm -hmm. uh, the world's public may well enjoy the film. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a very common response of the people I've interviewed, uh, that Cannes was the kind of the moment they knew something special was going on. Um, I, we'll bring, I might say, yeah. so it's not disingenuous to Peter and Barry, the producer and the director and the producer. It was evident from the very outset that something special was going mm. on. Was it going to be a hit? Was it going to reach the world in the way it did? We could never have predicted that. But all, I would argue that every single individual involved went into this to try and make it as special as it could possibly be. Mm. And no day went past. Um, when it just didn't feel incredibly important and very, very special. And that, that was a very lovely part of this process. Mm. Luckily, almost always that's the case with the things that we've had the good fortune of working on. But of course, as the as the people listening in today uh, would acknowledge, um, there was probably never this moment before or again that happened yeah. on as well. Absolutely. Um, so you obviously you mentioned some of the other movies you guys have worked on. You've worked on uh, Avatar with James Cameron. You worked on uh, Narnia. Um, so working with Peter Jackson, what what do you feel like distinguishes or what's unique about Peter Jackson uh, versus other directors you've worked with? Uh, yeah, I'm so, sorry to the to the listeners because I really only have one answer, and I've been asked this question before. A number of times and I don't think I can really think of a different way to <laughs> put it. Um, I think first and foremost it's worth acknowledging the very unique and very small number of people in the world that are working in this area of mm. directing large blockbuster movies over in some cases over many years uh, under extraordinary budgetary uh, creative uh, challenges, uh, working with large groups of people. Uh, and it's worth, worth acknowledging that to pull off any movie at that scale, whether it's a blockbuster hit or a marginal success or even possibly a flop, uh, is, is an unprecedented challenge uh, that only a tiny number of people in the world can actually do because of the skills and capabilities necessary to harness that resource, put it through that filter and to deliver something that's meaningful, powerful, visually stunning, memorable, etc. And uh, all of the 
uh, directors that we've had the good fortune of working with over the last 30 plus years uh, all share very similar attributes uh, that make them of the caliber of people. Um, first and foremost, I would argue that they are people that are just simply fascinated with the world. They're yeah. inquisitive, they're interested, they observe the world, they have got a a Rolodex of knowledge because of this deep fascination. They're always incredibly well read, incredibly knowledgeable, uh, incredibly inspired by things. Uh, when we think about Peter and, the, and what differentiates him, I've said before, Peter, first and foremost to me, is a strategist. Uh, and I, for a for need of a much better uh, uh, explanation of what I mean by that. Uh, and it's a bit of a silly one, I apologize to Peter, but should he have been born 300 years earlier, he could well have been a general at the head of a major army, strategizing uh, the way that that army would uh, respond hmm. to uh, different uh, issues such as his skill in seeing the big picture and being able to maneuver uh, different components of it. Remember that Peter was the writer, a producer, the director, uh, significantly involved in the visual effects, yeah. heavily involved in the creative journey, uh, fundamentally involved in the marketing uh, and uh, the casting, the music, and on and on. So this requires a multi-tiered um, mind that's able to tackle all of these different uh, contributions in a unique and very powerful way. And uh, all done in a humble, quiet uh, demeanor. So uh, yeah. yeah, needless to say, we're lucky. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, you mentioned him, you know, uh, commanding uh in battle we know that he can throw a spear from his cameo in uh in the two towers so <laughs> yeah um yeah. so i'll pull in another uh viewer question here so albert asks uh first he says uh thank you sir richard for being who you are and doing what you do my question is is there a personal project you'd like to bring to life one day perhaps a story you've written i'd love to see it do you have a a personal uh, passion project? Oh, thank you, Albert. And first and foremost, everyone, please, just Richard. I've never quite got the handle on this sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I'm 56 years old now, and uh, obviously I've got another lifetime of passion projects that I would love to do. Something I was aspiring to do for 10 years. We had five separate goes of it. Sadly, for Tanya and I, it's probably fallen out of our lives. Uh, we can no longer afford to fund it, uh, it ongoingly anymore. And it's probably missed us as an opportunity. But that was to build a museum mm. uh, in Wellington in celebration of the Lord of the Rings. And uh, it hasn't been particularly well documented, that journey, but little bits have come up in the press over the years. Um, we are building uh, a sculpture park of our own for the neonatal trust that we are patrons of and have been for 17 years now, 18 years, I think. Uh, and that that is a way that we can raise uh, money for that charity. Uh, we've we've taken a flat piece of farmland an hour outside of Wellington and turned that into a, uh, hopefully what will one day be a very beautiful spot. But we invite uh, uh, interested groups, gardening groups and car groups and so on to come along and then they donate $500 and I take them for train rides on a miniature railway that we've built and Tanya caters their morning or afternoon tea. And, it's just a lovely way to do it, but I have a great passion for sculpting, so we're building out a sculpture park. I've actually been building with some of my colleagues here, um, Middle Earth at guinea pig scale. So we've completed Hobbiton, Bree, uh, we're almost finished Edoras, Minas Tirith, um, Rivendell, 
uh, building or think at the moment, uh, mm. the mines of Moria. And all of this is built to the scale of guinea pigs because one day I'll populate with the guinea pigs. And the <laughs> idea is a silly thing. So it's about three times as big as the room that I'm sitting in right now. And this is where little toddlers can come and enjoy mm. hanging out, uh, lying amongst the guinea pig pop, hopefully uh, getting to um, be bitten by the Lord of the Rings bug at an early <laughs> age uh, in a fantastical way. So that's yeah. a passion project, and it's more than filling. I, I work on that in the weekends with, mm. uh, with Tanya, and um, that, that's filled the last nine years of any available time I might have. Mm. Uh, when, when I finish that, I'll then start another project. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've almost got a uh, pathological issue that if a moment opens up where I might be able to rest for a sec, I fill it with something else and go get going <laughs> on another project. So uh, uh, I'm thankful for that in some ways, but boy, sometimes I wish I could just... Uh, sit back, put my feet up and enjoy it for a moment. <laughs> yeah, you've got all that beautiful scenery that we're all envious of everywhere else in the world. And it sounds like you're uh, toiling away instead of enjoying that New Zealand scenery. <laughs> yeah, I am not. My wife goes tramping uh, off and she's walked, I think, all of the great tracks of New Zealand, or if not all, almost all of them. Um, that's not my scene. I, I, because I can't. Um, if you, if you're tramping, you can't be making. So, uh, if you're sitting True. on the beach, unless you're building sandcastles, you can't <laughs> be making. So uh, that's not my lifestyle. So, uh, <laughs> as long as I can be doing something with my hands, I'm entirely yeah. satisfied. <laughs> I bet you could make a really epic sandcastle, though. <laughs> uh, well, I love doing dinosaurs and recreations of Thunderbird craft <laughs> when I do sandcastle. Nice. Uh, but, you know, my, my daughter and I just spent the weekend uh, making handmade paper. Amelia's now 15 years old and something she's been hankering to do through lockdown. So we set about, and uh, by the end of Sunday, had two fairly lovely books that she uh, then hand sewed together um, mm. down the spine. So that sort of project is great fun as well, even if it's not uh, monumental projects, just yeah. fun things like that all the time is great. <laughs> all right, we've got another question here from uh, Cyrus. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, you're an inspiration and a legend, Sir Richard. What is the one thing you've made for any film or project that has special meaning to you? Uh, thank, thank you, Cyrus, for those kind words. Um, oh, boy, that's a hard question. <laughs> it, it is so disingenuous to the people that work with you and to the, to the directors that give you the opportunity to not treat everything with some level of reverence. Mm. Uh, you know, in need of an answer to your question, I think, <laughs> I think in equal balance, Sting, Sting and Orchrist are the mm. two things. To have read about Sting as a child, to, to, to have Sting in your mind, to then get a chance to be part of the team that made it and then put it on screen mm. and define a Sting for a generation visually, obviously Tolkien's writings define Sting, but to then create a, a visual image of it in the way that we got the chance to do. And then to do it again on uh, when we came back to do The Hobbit with Orcus. Yeah. That, that is bonkers. That, that is really hard to, I, well, it's not hard to explain to the people listening in uh, because you would all get it. That's yes, right. Ah, look at that. Yes. How yes. So I, yeah. I purposely had this sitting next to me because I was going to ask you about the design of this because this is one of my absolute favorite swords from the films. This is kind of like my crown jewel of my collection here. Um, so tell yeah. me about, about the design process for Orchrist. Uh, well, it all starts with drawing. I apologize to the designers that I may forget who designed it. It may be Paul Tobin, maybe Daniel Falker, it may be someone else I can my mind is getting terribly hazy on these details these days. 
when you do film after film or project after project and they just come at you so fast, I, I call the moment you're on the project, I call it being a momentary expert. You have to consume an immense amount of knowledge to become able to do the film to the level that's required. You read insatiably, you study, you you learn everything you possibly can. We're on we're on a film right now, which I'm in the process of doing that. I, every waking minute, I'm trying to consume knowledge uh, on that particular subject, but you tend to forget it. But anyway, in answer to your question, it all starts with great drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, today, that is somewhat done in Photoshop, but originally all in just pencil, coloring in pencil, felt tip markers when we were doing Lord of the Rings. Mm. And even today, a number of our designers will still instigate that first drawing with a pencil because there's a certain uh, organic sense to a line that you can achieve with a pencil yeah. uh, that uh, that can find a form maybe a little more easily than in Photoshop. Um, and then, as you can see in the beautiful form of that blade, yeah. Yeah. I love how the curvature the S curve starts mm -hmm. at the uh, at the very beginning of the uh, the hilt, the tip mm -hmm. of the the actual um, tooth sticking out of the hilt. Yeah. It flows all the way to the tip of the blade. Yeah. Uh, we then prototyped it, uh, and Peter Lyon, our our swordsmith, uh, will do a mock up prototype. Often we'll cut it out of black cardboard to get a size measurement. Uh, we'll show that to the director as it's been well documented in the behind the scenes. Even today, uh, we'll sometimes do a low cost 3D print of the blade mm. so we can actually feel it three dimensionally yeah. and sense its, its form and its shape and we'll adjust it. And, and you know, you're adjusting things by a single millimeter in mm. many, many cases. There's this, maybe there's a perception that uh, once you've got the drawing, that's it, you copy it exactly. It's not always the case because something may look fine two-dimensionally, but once it's three-dimensional, it may look a little bit too clunky or not sit nicely. And I've said before, I, I, it is a bit, um, maybe it's a bit arrogant to say this and I apologize for it, but I do feel that when we're making an object, it's a prop. And when we're making the movie, it's a prop. But when we finish the movie, it becomes an artifact. I, mm. I, 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 to not think like that, I do think is, is some way disrespectful to the craftsmanship that's going into the object. Uh, you know, these these objects like the ore crystal, the sting, and every other mm -hmm. sort of gun or, or suit of armor that we're making has been made by a group of craftspeople at the very height of their uh, of their capabilities, pouring their passion into the object, and it, it becomes an artifact. It, it, to me, it becomes a museum-worthy artifact. And mm -hmm. I'd like to always think that we can retain that mentality that nothing's just a throwaway. Uh, you know, just yesterday, I was watching Marco, the head of our model making department, who was reconfiguring something he had already done on a, it was for a futuristic gun because he had found that the braided cable was locking up in a manner that wouldn't work should you actually be in the field using a real gun. Mm. And he therefore, even though it's a prop, he had gone to the trouble of reconfiguring a swivel connection that would allow for the braided cable to move beautifully when the gun was being manipulated. And that's all an extra cost. It's, it's more mm -hmm. burden on the bottom line, et cetera. But had he not done it, it's probably something I would have asked him to do, have done it. But yeah. it was lovely that he thought to do it because it was necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's that eye to detail that's so special. So, Yeah. Well, you clearly have an incredible team down there as we have all seen the the fruits of your labors. Um, one question I've, I've always been curious about with the production timeline of the Hobbit uh, trilogy um, how far into the design process did you get when uh, Guillermo del Toro was 
um, slated to be the director? Uh, if I understand your question, uh, not at all. Uh, he was brought on very, or he wasn't. Uh, Guillermo uh, became part of the team and the leader of the project uh, early on. And I can't actually recall, Matt, I think we were only uh, a small way in um, mm. because it was, uh, you know, I'm sorry, everyone, I can't remember. Uh, maybe we'd already done a body of work, but Yemo was with us, I think, for two years. And mm. the, the it's a shame in many ways that everyone can't see the, the vision that Yemo had for the movies because uh, it was extraordinary and unique. Uh, and we really started entirely again when Guillermo left the project mm -hmm. to then realize Peter's vision for the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't answer that question with accuracy other yeah. than just say uh, it was joyful working with Guillermo. Yeah. Uh, you all know his work from other movies, so just imprint that vision onto a world of Middle Earth. Uh, and But it was also fabulous uh, when we when Pete took up the reins and uh, mm -hmm. we carried on as if, you know, nothing had changed since the Lord of the Rings days. So, yeah, yeah it, was, it was all all good fun. Yeah, great. Yeah, I know, we, you know, a lot of us have been curious. Uh, that's always something I've wanted to ask because I was, I was always curious if it got to, like, concept art phase, if that's as far as it got. I know people have talked about his vision for it. I didn't know if it was just kind of you know, him verbally expressing it, or if like, you know, pen got put to paper or pencil to paper, sorry. Uh, well, we, we did we did two years of design. We, yeah. we did a massive amount of design. We mm. were ready to make his film. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was almost entirely designed that you could literally have uh, instigated the build process. We had marketed a huge amount of stuff the marquettes are extraordinary, highly, highly detailed, very beautiful marquettes of large number of characters and uh, war machines and, uh, uh, you know, just really beautiful stuff. Uh, I hope that one day it all gets seen because uh, it was a lot of work for, you know, a lot of enjoyable work, but it's still a lot of work that's a shame to see um, boxed up and hidden from the world. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I'd say is that... Um, Guillermo is a, as you will understand from the interviews that we all watch on on uh, television of him, he is truly a unique human being in, in the most wonderful and warm way. Uh, having him come into our facility, you know, we're a, a very quiet, reserved, uh, collected group of people within our building, uh, I would argue, uh, comparatively. Uh, to this uh, extraordinary larger than life um, individual that came and joined us for those two years and, and uh, really inspired us in a way that uh, that is unique for his particular mm -hmm. aesthetic and love of cinema and so on. So it was nothing but delightful, but boy, um, it certainly was colourful. Uh, I wonder whether some of our team are still slightly um, uh, uh, gun-shy from it today. <laughs> it, was, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was just fabulous in, in a fun, joyful, collegiate way. Yeah. Well, if there's if there should ever be a book or something of uh, the designs from Guillermo del Toro's Hobbit released, it will be the quickest pre-order I will have ever done, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I one last question. I know we're running short on time here. Um, so recently you were on um, Billy and Dom's uh, Friendship Onion podcast, and uh, you mentioned, you know, that some in the movie industry, you know, can kind of see fans as, I, I believe you said uh, fans as a bother, which uh, you said, I believe I'm quoting you here, that that's a load of crap. <laughs> um, so what is it about the uh, Tolkien fandom and the relationship that you guys have with Tolkien fans that's so special? Uh, well, yeah, I, I can't recall exactly what I said, but um, <laughs> I do, I mean, 
everyone's situation is different and who am I to um, imprint my thinking on, say, a A-level uh, lead actor that is dealing with uh, fan groups very intensely through their professional careers. Yeah. But, no, I did. I didn't mean it in any kind of you know. No, no, that, I, you I know, respect, it was it was all good humor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I respect that, but the, I was very. Um, I was making a point because we do witness uh, this certain air of uh, a certain air from time to time, and I'm surprised because you know you think about the fans of of Middle Earth, of Tolkien, of, of the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, we are, we're fans. We love the movies. We, we, if we had worked on them, we would have been passionate um, audiences of them. Uh, I would have, I can't imagine how catalytic uh, it would have been for me had I had access to the behind the scenes making of videos growing up. Uh, if, I had to be part of those videos, it would have been incredible. And of course, almost everyone that is a fan of Lord of the Rings is a fan of exactly the same things I'm a fan of. They're, yeah. they're a fan of literature, uh, of uh, fantasy. They're a fan of wonderful and extraordinary um, places. They so So it's natural to... Uh, to connect to the fact mm. that those people are almost certainly going to be people very similar to myself, to my wife, to the people that we associate with. And uh, as I was explaining on the call, that's allowed us to become very close friends with some of the people that we've met around uh, uh, the world. You know, we went to a convention about 18 years ago in London, where we were a table host, and we sat next to this wonderful group of people, and uh, we got to meet these two sisters, uh, Sabine and Gassine, uh, who are German but live in Ireland, and uh, they've become two of our closest friends, and they've journeyed out to visit us, they've come and stayed with us, they've become very close friends with my dad, um, I correspond with them often uh, they've become almost like adopted aunties to our children. I mean, you just can't, you, and I picked those two out, but there's a number of people like this. You can't, you can't hope to find that sort of connection with people unless you have a connection through something that you love. It could be, you know, a, a bird spotting society or, uh, or flower growing uh, groups or it just happens to be around the pop culture of the film industry and specifically the love of, of Tolkien's work and the movies that were made. Yeah. So we feel very fortunate. I think that's a long-winded way to sort of justify <laughs> what I was on about there. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Um, well, uh, Richard, I know you got to get going. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I will plant the one little seed. I love these mini epic figures, and I my dream is to see this as an animated series someday. So oh, I'm just hey, going to plant that seed with, with these designs. To that uh, question uh, about what that's one of the things that is definitely in my wish I could do uh, box. Uh, mm. I love the mini epics. I'm actually looking at them all over on the <laughs> shelf here. they made by Mauro and Orgelina. And uh, the Lord of the Rings mini epics are just so endearing. And oh, I, uh, love them. I love them. And I would love to see us one day do something animated with them because they're so beautiful. I know that they're all digital. But I, I would actually love to see a stop animation Oh, uh, that would be fantastic. That would be gorgeous because they're just so set up for that. But uh, yeah. hey, to, to you, Matt, thank you uh, for your interest and to everyone uh, that's listened in. It's lovely chatting to you all. I'm sorry I can't see you all uh, to say hi, but um, uh, it's really nice that, what, 20 plus years after we got going on these movies, there's still a, a lovely interest in, uh, in what what they're about and why it's so important to us and so important to the next generation that we we don't let these things slip off into the archives um, 
So my best to you all. I'm going back into the workshop. Put my mask yes, back on. Put your mask on, yes. <laughs> yeah, luckily for you, well, luckily for all of New Zealand except for Auckland, we're just about to go to level two as oh. of midnight tonight. So that means our crew can be back in the workshop with us, which is great because we've been That's fantastic. everyone. So yeah, cool. so you'll just be wearing it for the sawdust then at that point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. The The fandom for the films is alive and well. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and yeah, we'll have to have you back on sometime, maybe when uh, we get a stop motion mini epics movie yeah, or series. <laughs> that'd be lovely. Go All well, right. Everyone. Stay safe with uh, love to all from everyone down here in New Zealand. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next time here on Nerd of the Rings. Bye-bye.